in these difficult times in which we find ourselves. I would like to help, as others have, to bring us some little meditation from the Word of God. I have been studying recently in the lovely little book of Ruth, and I've seen some deeper things in it that I never really saw before. A little book that we've read many times, maybe at a fairly superficial level and enjoyed the romantic side of it, how that a girl who came from Moab found a husband in the fields of Bethlehem. I want to come to it not just at this point in time, but maybe over a number of weeks as we would be in difficult circumstances and closed up in our own homes and not able to fellowship and gather and study and discuss in the way that we normally would. And we appreciate everything and everybody that is making an effort to feed the people of God worldwide at this time. Let's read just a couple of verses together to introduce the subject. We'll not do too much in each session. Today I want to read in the last chapter of the book of Judges, Judges chapter 21 and verse number 25. And then we'll read maybe the first verse or so of the book of Ruth. Judges 21 and 25. In those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Ruth chapter 1 and verse 1. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges judged that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country or the fields of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. And the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi, and the name of his two sons, Malon and Chilion, Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah. And he came into the country of Moab and continued there. We know that God does bless the reading of his word to our hearts, whether we are in private or whether we are gathered together. Let's pray. Our Father, we ask for liberty in the Spirit of God as we would consider these things together. We pray for the illumination of the Spirit of God to shine upon the page. We pray that our hearts might be warmed and new lessons and fresh guidance might be given to our souls that we might be warm in our spirits and guided in our feet and blessed in our fellowship, even if we are isolated and separated in a physical way. Bless our land. Bless our country. Bless our government. Bless our health service. Bless and preserve those that are on the front line, meeting essential need. We commend them to thee very especially, and we pray that the hearts of many might turn to God, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to say a little bit about the position of this little book of Ruth. It really could have been set inside the book of Judges. We know that the Judges period covers something of maybe 450 years, if we count it through into the days of Samuel, who really was a judge and a prophet together. And he linked from the end of the Judges period over into the monarchy period. We might say more about that later. The little book of Ruth could have been set probably inside the book of Judges, early in the Judges period. It probably comes after the activity of Ehud, one of the early judges, who defeated Eglon, the king of Moab. And we have read that these people, this family that we read about in the book, they went down into the fields of Moab and they sojourned there. And possibly that was during the peace time when Israel had defeated Moab because the years of peace, 80 of them, that came after the defeat of Ehud and the people of Moab was the longest peace period in the whole of the book of Judges. Moab was a defeated foe as far as the military sense was concerned. And what this family didn't appreciate was that what Moab speak of, for Moab speaks in the word of God of the flesh and the activities of the flesh, and the desires and appetites of the flesh. When we consider where Moab came from and how the people commenced out of immorality, when we consider Eglon, the exceedingly fat king that Ehud slew, and how he slew him and how that story worked out, we see in it a very clear picture that 
As Egypt speaks of the world, so Moab speaks to our hearts and the word of God of all the activities and the desire and the uncleanness and the flesh and warnings in the word of God against turning into the flesh and being occupied with fleshly things, especially in difficult times. We can see that this little book of Ruth is set against a very, very difficult period. Not only in the wider sense is it set in the middle of the days of the judges. The judges were a sad time as far as spiritual things were concerned. The people got occupied with the fact that they had no visible king. They got occupied with the fact that the idolatrous nations round about had physical kings upon their throne. And they were grumbling as they grumbled in the wilderness, as they had grumbled all their days since God bought them and purchased them and redeemed them out of Egypt. They were grumbling and desiring to have a king. Chapter 17 and verse 6, chapter 18 and verse 1, chapter 19 and verse 1, and where we have read chapter 21 and chapter verse 25, it tells us over and over again as the book comes to a conclusion, there was no king in Israel. And then it tells us this sad summary of the Spirit of God. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Those two phrases don't need to be connected together in a spiritual sense. It is true that there was no physical monarchical king in Israel. But what they were meant to demonstrate was that Jehovah was their king. He was invisible, but he was amongst the people. His presence was there in Shiloh in the tabernacle. They had the ark and they had the priesthood and they had their sacrifices and they had the promise of the presence of God amongst them. And they had his promise that he would look after them and care for them and lead them as he had done in wilderness days for 40 years. And they got away from that and they got their eyes on the things round about and they got their eyes on difficulties and problems and they got their eyes on the flesh within and they began to think that they were worse off because they didn't have a visible and a physical king. We should remember in the days in which we live that even though we might have no visible leader and we might have no visible head, we have one who is the person of the Lord Jesus. He is enthroned in the heavens. He is already crowned with glory and he's soon to come and take those who are his and ready for him home. We have his Holy Spirit whom he sent at Pentecost not only to be in the church, the body of Christ, but to be in every single individual believer and to be working in the world. He said he would be in us and he would be with us. And so we have that presence. He is here, a divine person. He is active. He is moving. He is working. And this activity will continue in the sense in which it is now until the church is taken home. And so we have a head and we have one who is in charge and we have one who is alongside and we have one who is our redeemer. We'll see much of him in the book of Ruth and we'll see one who has paid a full redemption price and is able to bring the whole world to himself and reconciliation and forgiveness if they get their focus off themselves and their difficulties and their problems. And in these days of trouble and difficulty, they turn to him. So we look at the spiritual condition of the background of this little book of Judges and this little city of Bethlehem that was found in the middle of the tribe of Judah in the district of Ephrath. And we'll come to these names a little later. We see that there was a terrible cycle that was repeated over and over again in the days of the people in the book of Judges. First of all, they rebelled against Jehovah. They overturned his leadership and they turned away from him and they worshipped the gods of the nations round about. And then Jehovah sent chastisement in different forms. He sent famine amongst the people. He brought in their enemies to oppress them. They came in and they captured the good of the land and they took it away. And they took their sons and they took their daughters captive. And then when the people had been oppressed and chastised by Jehovah, then they returned to him and they prayed to him and they sought his help. And Jehovah raised them up a saviour. He raised them up a judge to help them to overthrow their enemies. And then there was a time of peace and there was a time of harvest again and a time of reaping, and a time of sowing, and there was a period of rest and calmness. And then after a generation, they forgot all that God had done for them, and all the lessons that God had taught them. And that cycle started over again. Thirteen judges 
in that beautiful book of Judges right through to Eli. Thirteen times God touched them. Thirteen times God brought them back. And thirteen times they rebelled. And that's not even strange to our hearts because thirteen is actually in the word of God the number of rebellion. Against the background of that book and against the background of that period, there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And then as well as that difficulty, we see a second one. Because we see in the district of Bethlehem, we're not told if it was the whole nation. It was in the tribe of Judah. It was in the district of Ephrath, a name that means fruitfulness and fertility. And in Bethlehem, the city which means the house of bread, a place of bread and a place of plenty. And these names, it seems to be that spiritually and physically they have been overturned. There is no fruitfulness in Ephrath. There is no bread to be found in Bethlehem. There is a time of famine. And we'll look in another session at the meaning of some of the famines that come in the word of God and the testing that is brought through famine and people that are brought into famine conditions that God might test their hearts. And we will see some that passed their famine test and we'll see some that failed their famine test. And this family, in this little story, it seems to be that they failed their famine test and they turned away from God. So the position of the book, there was famine spiritually in the land. People were turning from God and they were doing that which was right in their own eyes and they'd no care for Jehovah and they'd no care for his goodness and they'd no care for the worship of God. Then there was in the district of Bethlehem and in the area of Ephrath and in the tribe of Judah, there was a famine. And so there was no food and there was a problem. And in the midst of all those circumstances, there was a family. And we'll look in this little book of Ruth and the early part of it at the family and how they behaved and what they did, what their activity was and their backslidden condition. I know the word is not found in the book, but we'll use that and apply it to the family in its early days because we're going to see there was backsliding. And then we're going to see by the grace of God, there was that lovely picture and story and type as well as in literal form for the individual, there was true restoration. And not only restoration, but there was redemption. One from an outside place who had no claim whatsoever on the covenant promises of Jehovah to his people. She found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And she was drawn to the true worship of the God of heaven and the God of eternity. And in the story of Ruth, whose name is the title of this lovely book, we'll see a story not just of restoration, because she didn't need to be restored. Restoration begins amongst the people of God. She was outside. She was unregenerate. And in her heart and in her story, we'll see the true blessing of the story of redemption. Not only restoration, not only redemption, we'll also see a lovely story of romance. And from romance, there comes even more than that. There comes not only a marriage, there comes the promise of monarchy and royalty. Before we come to the end of the book, we'll actually get a lovely name. We'll get the name of David. The family genealogy will skip forward two or three generations. It's not told us in the book that David is king. But we know from other parts of the scripture that he is the man who's going to be king. And we go away back to Genesis chapter number 49. And we remember what old Jacob said in his last prophecy before he died. A wonderful chapter in the book of Genesis. The scepter shall not depart from Judah. That's the tribe we're concerned with in this book. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the staff of rule from between his feet, until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. And when we speak of David, the one who was a man after God's own heart, the one who was not the first king, but the second king, and that's a lovely type as well, the man who prefigures the person of the Lord Jesus and his millennial kingdom, and the one who will possibly even, in a very strange kind of way, as prince, will even share in the millennial glory of the Lord Jesus Christ in a day that is to come. And so, in the position of this lovely little book, it has been lifted out of the book of Judges. It could come in chapter 3 or chapter 4, and we wouldn't pay as much attention to it if it was just set inside the first hundred years of the book of Judges. But instead of that, the Spirit of God and the divine author and the human pen man, possibly Samuel, who wrote these early books, 
Maybe it was Samuel who wrote Judges. Maybe Samuel wrote Joshua. Maybe Samuel wrote this lovely book of Ruth. Maybe Samuel penned his own story. We're not sure. But this little book of Ruth has been lifted maybe 300 years out of its chronology. It's set after, at the end of the book of Judges. It comes here at the conclusion. It links Judges with Samuel. It's as if one end of the book. It's stretching out a hand and it's laying hold on the Judges period. And it's looking back. And it's acknowledging the failure of the people. And it's acknowledging the failure of the law because the nation could not keep the law. And the law was not able to do what God intended because they said all that God has told us we will do. But they didn't do and they didn't even desire to do and they didn't even seek the help of God to do it. And yet this lovely little book is reaching out the other hand and it's laying hold of a new era and a new time and a new period. A time of great blessing, the time of the reign of David and what came after that, the reign of Solomon and the kingdom that God intended to remain as it was then, except there was further rebellion and they got away from him. And so we see in this lovely little book of Ruth, we see it laying hold, as it were, one hand on one side and one on the other. It is laying hold in the judges period, a time of failure, a time of broken law, a time of rebellion. And it's reaching out the other hand and it's saying, look forward, look forward to a day of blessing, look forward to a day of promise, look forward in faith to better days that are to come when God will fulfill his purposes, when God will bring in a kingdom and a king to rule and reign and bring in blessing and bring in peace and bring in harmony and happiness, even in homes and in families and in the hearts of individuals. We see all these things being developed in this lovely little book of Ruth. It is a book to give us hope. It is a book to give us encouragement. It is a book to lift up our hearts. We see a family that got away. Some of them, sadly, they died away from blessing and away from promise. And yet we see restoration and those that, because of their circumstances and the testing of God in their life, they responded in the right way and they came back. And we see those who were redeemed. And we will see as an amazing theme throughout this little book of Ruth, as we study it together, we'll see the guidance of the Spirit of God. We'll see the very footsteps of a girl being guided in to the very field that she, she should work in. We'll see those who cared for her, those who looked after her, those who provided for her. Just as in the days in which we are living, there will be those, and they weren't engaged in that before. We have heard even within the last day or two about those who are volunteering to help those who are in need. And that's a worthy cause. And we'll see those in this book who are willing to give more than the law asked for, more than was demanded in law to give in grace, to give in superabundance, that those who are poor, that those who are fatherless, that those who are widowed, that those who are strangers, and we'll find that Ruth, qualified on a physical level on all four of those counts. She was entitled to charity that was contained within the law. She was entitled to blessing and she received that blessing. She got food sufficient for herself and for Naomi, but she got in grace even more than she was entitled to. And we're going to see those lovely lessons that we will learn within this beautiful little book of Ruth. That's something about the position of the book set against the background of the book of Judges, set against the background of failure and people turning away from God, and set against the famine that was in the land of Judah at that particular time. Let me say a little word then, just as we would come to an end of this little session, a little bit more about the purpose of the book. We've touched on many of the things that are contained within its pages and its chapters in the wider and in the narrow sense. The purpose of God is not only in relation to the historical background of the book, not only to the typical pictures that are contained within the book. We're going to see as we go that Boaz, as we get him mentioned, first of all, in chapter number two and verse one, when he's just mentioned as an acquaintance, then we'll see he becomes the kinsman redeemer. And we'll see he's one who is able and one who is willing and one who suit and one who has the right relationship that he can redeem. And we'll see developing in a wider and in a wider 
And in a wider sense, we'll see Boaz becoming a more and more complete picture of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, who has come and paid the ultimate price that he might redeem Adam's race, fallen humanity, those of us who fell in the first man, that we might find salvation and redemption in the second man. We'll see something of the wider purposes of God in the book of we as well. We'll see the pictures that the Spirit of God is painting. It points forward to not only a redemption that was completed at Calvary, but it points forward to the full completeness of the redemption, the redemption of the creation, the redemption of mankind. We look forward and see all that's going to take place in a day when the one who is the kinsman redeemer is going to come and rule and reign. We'll see the widest purposes of God pictured in the book right from the fall of Adam, right through to the very reign of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ when his kingdom has come in and the days of kingdom are brought to be fulfilled in this world. We can see in the book of Ruth, just as I come to a conclusion, we can see in the book of Ruth that is called after her own name. We can see a lovely contrast in the purposes of God with another little book, the book of Esther, the two books in the Bible that are given the names of women. In Esther, we see a Jewess amongst the Gentile people. And God brought her into a relationship with a very important king, that there might be preservation of the nation and the people of God. In the book of Ruth, we see a girl who was a Gentile, and she was brought in amongst the people of the Jews. And she was brought into a very important relationship in a man who was the kinsman redeemer. And out of that is not the preservation of the nation, that is Israel. Out of that is the preservation of the promised seed and the promised line. And so we'll see again something more of the purposes of God. The things that the evil one has attacked right from the fall in Eden's garden. When he was made aware in Genesis 3 and 15 that there was a pattern and a plan and a purpose. That God would send the promised seed of the woman. And that seed would crush the head of the serpent. He has attacked the line of the woman. That there might not be a seed. And since the promise to Abraham, he has attacked the nation, that it might not be able to bring forth the promised seed, and there might not be a future for the nation. And yet God in grace has fulfilled one. Messiah came. He was rejected. He was put on a cross. He died. He rose again. He has provided redemption for Adam's race and the wider purposes of God for the world and for the nation of Israel and for a redeemed race and for the church. They are still to come. And so we see in this little book of Ruth, the preservation of the nation and the preservation of the promised line running through the very centre of the book and the fulfilment of the purposes of God. In this little family, we look at them in the next session. We look at Elimelech and what his name means in contrast to the background of the day in which he lived and his family and what happened to them and the dangers and disasters that fell him. And then the blessing that began in the restoration when Naomi made her mind to return and come home. We look forward to these other things that we will study together in days to come we trust in this lovely little book as we read it and consider it together. May the Lord bless us all in his word and at these times.